Here is uh, one of my favorite people in New York, in the New York entertainment community. I love to have him on the program. What uh, is interesting to me is it seems like everything goes in cycles. The first year I came to New York, his show, The Wiz, was on Broadway. And Jeffrey Holder is back to tell us about its return to Broadway. A nice welcome at home for Jeffrey Holder. It's good to see you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Bill. Well, Thank you know what I'd like you to do? In the lure of show business, they're every big hit, and The Wiz has been a big hit. You won some Tonys for it, and you've gone on to do a lot of other things. There are always great creation stories behind what it took to get the thing to Broadway. Can you tell us a little bit about, when you go way back, I guess into the early 70s or whatever, what some of the major barriers that it took to get the property of The Wiz in shape, even to get the money invested in it? Judy Garland did an incredible job in The Wizard of Oz, which is a movie, and uh, everybody says, you know, you know, who's going to play Judy Garland? Who's going to play Judy Garland? And in my head, I wanted to make it an American fairy tale, not a white fairy tale, mm -hmm. but an American one. Right. The next year, we can do it with American Indians, where little Dorothy Lisa Powwow <laughs> and flies to the land of Oz and return. It can be done easily. Sure. Well, in order to do that, I'm visual. So I stayed home one Sunday and I told the producer I'll do some drawings. So I stayed home and I did 40 drawings of how Dorothy should look, mm -hmm. the, the wizard should look, the tin man, the scarecrow, the lion, all in arm. Right. And then when uh, the producer went to Los Angeles to meet Gordon Stahlberg, uh, a 20th Century Fox, uh, Ken Harper. He, I said, don't leave without the drawings. And he took the drawings and he took Charlie Smalls and he came back with $750,000. So they bought the concept there. Yeah. Early on, did you, do you remember people saying, well, you really can't touch that? I mean, that's... The, one well, of the people said you can't touch the Bible as well. That's <laughs> right. Know. And that's been a source of inspiration well, you. for you know, some things which you're going to Why have. can't you touch that? Everybody will understand something. Mm -hmm. The way I see God is not the way you see God. I mean, you see him in your environment. Yeah. Or, you feel him. Him. or you, you feel, feel him. You feel him, and he may be black, green, or Chinese, you know. Yeah. That's right. So the whiz comes back. To, tell tell that us. That is glorious. I'm happy what, about that. What's got to be different after this period of time? I mean, it, well, the world is somewhat different than it was in 1975. Well, I think the whiz is ageless. It's like the nutcracker. You can bring it back anytime. I'm uh -huh. so very happy that it's coming back because <clears throat> children, if you want, really want to introduce children to the theater, to see the Wiz, mm -hmm. or take them to see Oliver, or take them to see Annie. Yeah, we always think of the adults, you know. Well, you know, they, they well, it's like a Disney classic, actually. It's a Disney classic, and you take the Wiz, you can bring it back every five years because children have grown up. Yeah, the child that was born when the Wiz closed is now five years and ready to go, ready to go to the theater, and this is a nice introduction. What were what were you some of your introductions to theater and show business when you were? At the age that you were just talking about, say an eight, nine year old. Oh, I was thrown in, on the stage. I would, I danced on the stage when I was seven, and my first dance was the Shim Sham Shimmy. We down south in Birmingham. I mean south in. <laughs> well, where did you learn? How, where did you learn to do that? I learned to do that because of my brother. My brother. You know, children are uh, imitators. You yeah. know, whatever I saw my brother do, I copied. So mm -hmm. I, he learned to dance, and Susie Q and the Shim Sham Shimmy was in, and so I, Jeffrey, like a little monkey, imitated him. Do you ever have? Did you ever have stage fright? No. So it's, no. it's a natural process for you. It's a natural. Oh yes, I had stage fright once. That was in Waiting for Godot. Yeah. Only because I had to do Lucky's speech, and I had a speech impediment that was very. I, you know, I used to stammer badly. Mm -hmm. I used to say, Bill, that's how I spoke. Was that bad? Very you express bad. yourself through your body, but not your voice in those yeah. days. Right? But then I had just lost it, and for me to do lucky speech, I was like this, and then I let it all happen. What do you, what do you say to somebody who's watching right now who has sometimes similar problems? Like, they know they've got a big, long thing to do. Use it. Use the fear. Use that use fright. Use the fear. Because a lot of performers who aren't just petrified before going on. So you use the stage to get rid of your fear. Oh. You know, it's a if you look back in your career as, as, a, as an actor, as a, as a dancer, and as a, a producer, a director, a set designer, uh, what are some of the things that have happened that have really been in the classic embarrassing moments for you or things you've observed? 
I it don't. only really happens in live performance. I mean, you can't tell stories too much about what goes on in the movies. No. <laughs> no. I can tell you something that happened to me once. <laughs> but it was a little piece of bitry with another performer. I was performing in the Village Gate and I was singing. My romance doesn't have to have a moon and it's carrying on. My act was singing and Jeffrey Holden was going to sing. And it was very successful. And this next season they asked me back. I had to close the show. I was the act. The opening act was Nina Simone. Nina Simone was your opening, opening act. act. And she sang, I love you, Porgy. I love you. She sang, ooh, she beat the breath. I love you, Porgy. She sang. Then I came on and I sang, My Romance. And I did my, my yeah. act out. The second show, she came on and did all of my songs. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a good gig for you, Tim. No. I well, what did you do then? I danced. <laughs> you should turn the whole show inside out and just dance. Was she sort of watching and looking at the side like this? Well, that was that was something very evil to do. She shouldn't have done that. Mm. And that was the only funny thing that has happened to me. Tell us about uh, the experience. You, you, we've seen you in some movies. You were in Annie playing Punjab. Oh, I love That was yeah. a great, uh, yeah, it was it. great to yeah. see you. And that, will you be in the, the second Annie? I heard that they're writing Annie too, and they want Punjab back. Uh, that would be great. The particular scene is wonderful at the end of Annie when you're, co you're lowering yourself down the, the, helicopter, the helicopter right, yeah. to save Annie. I love all those things that involve uh -huh. children. I did Dr. Doolittle, Annie. Uh, the gold bug and the ways, all those things yeah, are very for kids. for kids because they grow up, you know. I was, no, go ahead. They're dying to be entertained. I was reading that in, in the history of movies, this has nothing to do with you, but in the history of movies that have cost a lot of money and not earned it back, like Cleopatra and so forth, Cleopatra still is the number one champ. Dr. Doolittle was such a movie, it cost millions and millions of dollars more because of problems with the animals. No. That's what I read. It's not true. Not the animals. It was the weather. They chose a place in England to shoot, and it was damp and wet, and it rained. Then they chose marvelous St. Lucia in the Caribbean during the rainy season to shoot. Mm -hmm. So they were like six months over time. It wasn't the animals. Huh? Oh. What kind of animals did you have to work with in that? Oh, what did I have to work with? No, it was a mechanical one, the great pink sna sea snail. It's enormous. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It was fun, though. What do you think recently on Broadway, because you're part of the Broadway community here, the, the question of limiting the number of performances that someone does in a Broadway run. The traditional is eight, eight shows a week. Dustin Hoffman has been trying to cut back to seven. Al Pacino in American Buffalo was doing fewer than eight shows a week. Other people have done fewer than eight shows a week. And yet it remains a bone of contention between the producers and the, and the stars about how many shows should be done over in England. You see stars going on doing a three and a half hour play. Well, in the I afternoon. think you should do a show. Number one, yeah. I'll tell you something. I'm from Vaudeville, meaning uh, this is the best education in the business. When I danced at Radio City Music Hall in 1957, which is considered Vaudeville House, yeah. you were there at 10 o'clock. And you did a 10 o'clock show, you did a 2 o'clock show, you did a 4, and you did an 8. Mm -hmm. You did four shows a day, seven days a week. And that was the, that was your game. And you are dancing. Oh. And you get cold and you have to get warmed up again. You, if you're going to do a thing, an actor has to build his stamina mm -hmm. to do eight shows a week because it has to do with real estate. Yeah, you know, renting and, renting the property. Renting the property and so many people are involved, etc., etc., etc. It's a money-making affair. And we all know that's what it is about. Oh. I am not, you know, I do not know what they have in their contract or uh, somebody, you know, I don't know. But I think... Uh, if you want to be in the theater, you have to be prepared for all of that. How are the commercials going? Many people, I mean, I, I, if we went out to Indiana, if we drove out to, through Ohio, and you and I were around in a car, and we went to a coffee shop or something, they would recognize you first, maybe, from the 7-Up commercials. Yeah. And uh, That's all right. And you've won some Clio awards for yeah. this. Yeah. And I just did it in French. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, it's fun. Uh, yeah. I think it's good. Where have you gone? I've, you've been in some uh, exotic locations with those things, haven't you? No. Yes. Arizona, didn't I see you, Arizona, Los didn't I Angeles, see you on a beautiful beach Florida. doing the un... Miami. Miami. Yeah. Okay. Not in the Caribbean. It looks, it looks like it. Are you going to come to the opening of yeah, the Yeah, tell Wiz? me, because we got a minute here to review. The Wiz is back on Broadway officially. When? The Wiz, the, we have previews beginning the, the 18th. Of May. Of May. Right. And we open on the 24th. 
and it's supposed to be a limited run because we're supposed to go to Japan. And what about the cast? Stephanie Mills reprising? Stephanie Mills reprising. Dorothy. Dorothy, and I have an excellent cast. I have uh, Greg Baker, who plays the lion and who is marvelous. Carl Hall, Juanita Fleming. Uh, oh, Anne Ducanet plays the good witch at the end of the show. Oh, good. And I have her, tongue in cheek, sitting on a half moon. But the half moon is a slice of watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of changes. Yeah, a lot of changes. Okay, we'll look for the whiz coming up this month, Jeffrey. It's always good to see you. See you at the opening. Okay, good. Thank you right. very much.